Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 791 for November 3rd, 2019. Coming up in a few minutes. What personality and flavor does your area of the world use and celebrate? What exemplifies it? And use that. Whether the ingredient is actually from there or not, make something that kind of represents the personality and character of a place. Um, and I'd love to see, I mean, I'd love to, well, I'm, I'm not even a big wine guy. Plenty of you guys know a lot more about wine than me. But even the wine world has been debating this for the last two decades. Does terroir even exist in wine or is it all bullshit? This time around, I'm in Westboro, Massachusetts, where Ryan Maloney of Julio's Liquors hosted the American Single Malt Whiskey Seminar this weekend, along with the annual Julio's Whiskey Road Show, where I am right now. American Single Malts have been growing in popularity, even though there is no official definition of just what they are, and that is something the distillers of American Single Malts have been trying to change. They had a discussion about terroir today as part of that evangelism, and we'll have some of the highlights on Whiskey Cast in depth. Along with the What I'm Tasting This Week department, the calendar of events, and on behind the label, we'll look at Tennessee's famous Lincoln County process of charcoal mellowing. There are almost as many ways of doing it as there are distilleries in Tennessee. We'll also announce the winner of the Whiskey Club of the Month, too. It's all just ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's begin with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. And there's both good news and bad news. We'll start with the good news. Kentucky distillers set new records in 2018 for both current year production and barrel inventories. Data from the State Revenue Department and the Kentucky Distillers Association show that the state's distillers filled 2.1 million barrels of bourbon last year. That's the most in one year since record-keeping began back in 1967. As of January 1st, 9.1 million barrels of spirits were maturing in rickhouses around Kentucky, That's also a new record, breaking the old one of 8.7 million barrels back in 1967. Eight and a half million of those barrels are filled with bourbon, while the rest have either rye whiskey or other spirits maturing inside. Here's yet another sign of the industry's growth. It's taking longer to calculate those numbers each year, according to Eric Gregory of the Kentucky Distillers Association. In Kentucky, you have to file a barrel inventory report every year of your number of barrels you have as of January 1st um, of that year. And um, now that we've got so many distilleries in the Commonwealth, we used to have those numbers by about March or April. Um, Now it takes till September or October for everybody to get those things in and then for the state to make sure every, you know, all the the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So um, we work with them to get that numbers. And turns out our records at KDA actually go back farther than their records. So when I started pulling our historical charts to see when was the last time we had 9 million barrels in, in uh, the Commonwealth, our, our records go back to 1967, and we have never had 9 million barrels. Um, so I called the Revenue Cabinet, and they said, no, your records go back farther than ours. So um, if, if you say it, that's right. And I said, well, Okay, and then we've never filled 2 million barrels of bourbon uh, in in 52 years. The state uses those inventory records to assess the so-called barrel tax on each barrel of maturing spirits distillers have on hand. That tax raises about $25 million a year for school districts and local governments. Distillers have been able to take a tax credit for those barrel taxes against their state corporate income tax bill for the last several years, but... A move by Kentucky lawmakers last year to cut those corporate income taxes means many distillers wind up leaving money on the table 
since they now pay more in barrel taxes than they owe in corporate income taxes. Under state law, distillers have to reinvest the money from those credits in capital projects, such as new warehouses and visitor centers. Eric Gregory says the KDA would like lawmakers to change the law and make those excess credits refundable during the next legislative session. Now for the bad news. November is here, and there are now less than two months left for Congress and the White House to extend the tax break that's been a lifeline for many craft distillers around the U.S. The Tax Reform Act passed at the end of 2017 included a significant cut in the federal excise tax that distillers pay on the first 100,000 proof gallons of spirits they remove from bond for sale each year. Most craft distillers never even come close to that threshold, and they've been able to use the savings from the tax cut to expand their operations or hire new employees. Unless the tax cut is extended by midnight on New Year's Eve, it'll expire, and distillers will be facing a hefty tax increase in 2020. If that tax break is allowed to expire, Mark Schilling of Revolution Spirits in Texas believes many smaller distillers scraping by could wind up going out of business. He's been working on the issue for nearly a decade now. We're really in a sense of urgency right now in terms of getting this thing done. I feel like we're in a good place. On the bill itself, we've got almost 75% of the members in each chamber, House and Senate, signed on as co-sponsors. We've got an almost exact split between Republicans and Democrats on both sides. I mean, it's a highly bipartisan, highly popular issue, but that doesn't mean it has the legs to, to get across the finish line. The problem is that the congressional agenda between now and the end of the year is jammed with higher priority legislation, including budget resolutions that must be passed by November 21st in order to prevent another federal government shutdown. There are bills pending in both the House and Senate to make the tax cut permanent, and Schilling says the evidence over the last two years proves that this cut actually helped grow the economy. This is not really a major impact on uh, the federal budget. And at the same time, it's created growth in the industry. And that growth has helped local economies, local farmers, uh, you know, vendors, suppliers. You know, it impacts tourism. It impacts payroll taxes, local you know, sales taxes, property taxes, the whole bit. So overall, I, I think it's a win-win for the industry and for everybody else. You can listen to the entire interview with Mark Schilling in the news section at WhiskeyCast.com. Distillers have been lobbying actively for an extension of the tax break. Becky and Scott Harris of Virginia's Catoctin Creek Distilling are putting extra pressure on their senators, Tim Kaine and Mark Warner. Neither one has signed on yet as a co-sponsor for the extension. One of the benefits we have at least is we've been there before, so we at least you know, know what that means to our business and, and we've operated under those conditions before. But I'll tell you, when they went down, we hired people and you know we're gonna have to look at our budgets and tighten our belts. It's gonna be a really big deal. Will it affect the way you do production? Will you be able to produce as much whiskey if you have to send all that extra money to the government, Becky. Honestly, what the biggest thing that I was talking to Governor Kane about a couple weeks ago, or former Governor Kane, now Senator Kane, was that you know we made some improvements in our work with the Virginia ABC, and they're giving us a commission essentially on the sales we do in our tasting room. And what's going to happen is all that money that we're getting from the ABC, we're basically going to be sending it to Washington. So it's like. It's putting us right back where we started, and that's just really frustrating from a standpoint of, you know, we have, you know, 20 people working for the company right now, and trying to keep all those people with those kind of conditions, it's just really difficult. I know that uh, Senator Kane and Senator Warner have not yet signed on to sponsor the FET extension. Are you leaning on them on that one, too? You know I am. Uh, Senator Kane just had a roundtable uh, talking about the rural economy, and I know he's a fan of our whiskey, and I was I was uh, bending his ear on it just a couple weeks ago. So I'm really hopeful that, you know, maybe they will bring him on in the next couple, you know, next several weeks. 
But the real issue is, you know, A, there's the FET reform bill, you know, Senate Bill 362, House Bill 1175, that we really want to go and have it be permanent. You know, the extenders, they're all telling me that we're going to get the extension, but, you know, that's not a done deal until it's done. And right now with the situation in in Congress, I, it's really hard to feel optimistic that they're going to get it done. By the way, we do know that Senator Tim Kaine is a fan of Virginia craft spirits. Scott Harris personally delivered some whiskey to the senator's office this week to help them celebrate the Washington Nationals World Series championship. In other news, the hashtag Free Our Whiskey campaign in British Columbia is headed to court nearly two years after B.C. liquor inspectors raided the province's four Scotch Malt Whiskey Society partner bars. All four were accused of illegally sourcing the society whiskeys from private liquor stores in the province in violation of B.C. regulations. The province requires all bars, restaurants, and so-called hospitality licenses to source all of their wines and spirits directly from the provincial liquor distribution system. Three of the partner bars have accepted penalties from provincial regulators, but Fett's Whiskey Kitchen owners Eric and Delura Fergie have now taken their case to British Columbia's Supreme Court. That's after an appeal with the province's Liquor Control Board was rejected in September. Eric Fergie says the liquor inspectors not only violated their rights under Canadian law when they raided the Vancouver bar, but the inspectors also violated their own provincial guidelines. What they should have done, by following their own rules, is they should have uh, obtained a search warrant and gone through the sections, uh, the section of the act that, that uh, their act that they wrote to uh, and followed the rules and, and gone about that way. By coming in under uh, using inspection powers, they, uh, they effectively breached the charter. They did not issue a charter caution to Allura, who was there, my partner, wife. And so she has a, led her to believe they were using inspection powers to, uh, to come in. She was obligated to answer their questions and such. In doing so, she implicated us in, uh, uh, in, their, in the government's case against us. Had they used their, uh, the different section of the act, which requires uh, search warrants, uh, we would not have uh, been we would not have implicated ourselves as such. So that's kind of where we sit. And in doing so, they breached the charter. And the charter was not, it's a federal charter, it was not written to protect us from conducting business with each other. It was written to protect us from an overreaching, overbearing government. The province has not yet filed its response to the lawsuit in court, and BC's Ministry of the Attorney General declined to comment on the case because of the pending litigation. The liquor inspectors seized more than 240 bottles of Scotch Malt Whiskey Society whiskeys in the raid on FETS with an estimated value of around $40,000. Eric Fergie told us he's been assured that the bottles are still being held in evidence storage, even though provincial regulators could have had them destroyed after the initial rulings in the case earlier this year. With the holidays coming soon, we're getting plenty of new whiskeys just now reaching the market. Glendronic's new Master Vintage 1993 single malt takes a combination of Exoloroso and Pedro Jimenez sherry casks selected by master blender Rachel Berry. It carries a recommended retail price of $350 a bottle in the U.S. There's also a new batch of Glendronic cask strength. Batch 8 is 10 years old and will sell for around $95 a bottle. I'll have tasting notes for both of them soon at whiskeycast.com. Dewar's is releasing a new 15-year-old Aberfeldy single malt in Europe. It's finished in French oak Pomerol wine casks from Bordeaux and will have a recommended retail price of 55 pounds in the UK. That's about 64 euros. Hunter Lang & Company is out with a new series in its old and rare line of single cask bottlings. The Heritage Series includes 23 different whiskeys, 
all at least 30 years old, including a Dal Ewan, 46-year-old, and a 43-year-old from Tianinic. They'll be available at whiskey specialist shops worldwide. Jared Hempstead of Balconis Distilling is here with me in Massachusetts this weekend and missing a release party at the distillery back in Texas. They're unveiling a new batch of the Balconis Peated Texas Single Malt. We did our first round of Peated years ago, actually at the old building. Um, and we released that last year, but it was a tiny blend of three, three barrels. We've been working with the Simpson family since they don't offer Golden Promise as a peated exp uh, variety these days. But we really wanted that to be the only variable between our regular Golden Promise based single malt when we moved into peated. And they agreed to do it if we would take a certain amount, which when we moved in 2016, we could finally take that volume of grain. But because we didn't know what we wanted to do with it, we've laid down 35 ppm, 65 and 95. 50-50 in first use and then ex-bourbon just so when it's all ready we'll have all the different colors to work with. So last year's release was only three barrels. This year I think is about 12. Large majority of it, like 90% of it is first fill and a little bit of refill in there. It's all the 65 p ppm round. I mean it's super deep and nutty and it's, it's Highland Pete so much more similar to like Ben Riach or even you know, Spring Break Highland Park. You're like I don't get the briny coastal yet because it's not you know but it's pretty fun. It's available now at the distillery for $79.99 a bottle and will be at retailers in select markets over the next few weeks. Buffalo Trace is releasing its fourth batch of the OFC Vintage Bourbon. This one comes from 1994 and will be available later this month in what the distillery is calling very limited amounts. The recommended retail price, $2,500 a bottle. You can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long at whiskeycast.com. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. Larceny Bourbon's heritage goes back to the days when Treasury agent John E. Fitzgerald was patrolling the rickhouses of Kentucky, not just for the feds, but for himself. Mr. Fitzgerald was stealing a taste of some of his favorite barrels of weeded bourbon on the side. And today's award-winning Larceny Bourbon has the same soft, smooth character Fitzgerald loved. Look for Larceny Bourbon at 92 Proof at your local retailer and be on the lookout for the upcoming limited edition releases of Larceny Barrel Proof. Find out more at HeavenHillDistillery.com. Think wisely, drink wisely. Time now for the Whiskey Cast Calendar of Events. Whiskey Live Chicago is coming up on November 7th. We heard from Teeling Whiskey's Alex Chasco last time around. He'll be in Los Angeles for a tasting and dinner at Tam O'Shanter on the 8th. Glasgow's Whiskey Festival is this coming Saturday at Hampton Park. The inaugural George Washington Whiskey Festival is also on Saturday at Mount Vernon, just outside of Washington, D.C. And Whiskey Live Taipei is on the 9th and 10th in Taiwan's capital city. Hollyrood Distillery in Edinburgh, Scotland hosts Phil Thompson of Dornock Organic Distillers for a tasting on the 12th. Vinnie's will hold its Scotch Giving tasting on the 14th in Skokie, Illinois. And Ashok Chakalingam of Amrut will lead a tasting at the Seven Grand Whiskey Bar in Austin, Texas on the 14th as well. Finally, the International Whiskey Festival runs from the 15th through the 17th at The Hague in the Netherlands. Right now we have 224 different events around the world on our searchable calendar at whiskeycast.com and we're always adding new events. If you have a whiskey festival, tasting, or any other whiskey related event coming up, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to let us know about it. We'll be glad to add it to the list. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. 
Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast in depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Once again, I'm in Westboro, Massachusetts this weekend, just west of Boston, for the Whiskey Road Show at Julio's Liquors. Saturday afternoon, Julio's sponsored a session on American single malt whiskeys with members of the American Single Malt Whiskey Commission. That's the group of distillers seeking to get the federal government to create an official definition for American single malt whiskeys. The panelists, Jared Hempstead of Balconis Distilling, Chris Riesbeck of Westland Distillery, Gareth Moore of the Virginia Distillery Company, Ralph Lorenzo of Tuttle Town Spirits, and longtime whiskey writer Lou Bryson. Steve Hawley of Westland is the commission's executive director, and he served as the moderator for the session. They went for two full hours, and since the panelists agreed on almost everything, we're not going to share the whole session with you here. But they did disagree on the one thing that has been a subject of debate recently within the whiskey world. Is there terroir in whiskey? That sense of place that makes each individual whiskey unique. Author, consultant, and brand ambassador Robin Robinson says no. And he was sitting in the audience... You'll also hear from Ryan Maloney of Julio's Liquors as well. The whole thing started with a question from the audience. So I know like with wines, you get like the, the, like the, the terroir of the, the, the flavor for the same grape, different region. Does it happen with grains as well? Or, or is that, are they pretty neutral dependent on so wherever they're grown? I expand the question. I would like to get in on this. <laughs> Westland goes last on this <laughs> issue. You go first. I want to expand the, I expand the question to... Ron might want to get in on this. <laughs> so the, the, the question is, is there terroir to the grain, to barley? And then I want to, I want to broaden that question as well. I want you guys to talk about regions. Is regions, Ooh. regionality, a thing in American single malt whiskey should it be a thing? So Chris, do we need to wait for Robin to take his hearing aids out so we're gonna get his hands here? No. He's not. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Westland <laughs> fundamentally believes that absolutely there is a sense of terroir in grain. Full stop. You don't have to say much more than that. I will say this. Over the next few years, we'll be making releases that are highly specified to the region where the grain comes from. That we have in just early sampling from cask can recognize significant differences in the quality of the grain coming through. Absolutely. I also think, quite frankly, if that weren't the case, then you would only see monoculture large farms in one or two states, and they would just pump it out there, and they don't. If you grow a potato in Connecticut, if you grow a potato in Maine, if you grow a potato in Idaho, they all taste different. Why shouldn't that extend past it? Of course it does in my mind. It's in my mind, the, the, the fact that there is an argument to this is surprising because, quite <laughs> frankly, everything that exists that grows grain is located in that place. That is literally, that sense of place is what terroir is all about. If you add on the cultural pers perspective, yeah, there's probably an argument there to go, well, how does that fit in? But from an agricultural perspective, absolutely. Yeah, I'll just piggyback on that and let, then let Jared go. But Weston gets to go twice before anybody else. Yeah, he's, he's on the commission side. Yeah, he's not one of the He doesn't get to go. Well, he doesn't count. I was going to get to go he gets to ask questions, I right? Was, I was going to was gonna give you some credit. Okay. You want me to rub your neck this time? Um, you know, you mentioned, Jared, Maris Otter and Golden Promise, um, something that we've used at Westland to distill as well. But there are thousands of different varieties of barley mm -hmm. that exist. But the whiskey industry, particularly the Scotch whiskey industry, has only really used a handful in hundreds of years. And those barleys, those varietals that they've chosen, are chosen for sameness, right? They're chosen for the commodity system, frankly. Uniform. They're chosen for Budweiser, right? And the differences between those as they've moved from one to the other is really a choice of lesser cost and a little bit higher efficiency, right? But largely, the character of those grains are bred to fit the system that has been built to malt them, right? So. If you step outside of those and look at some of the thousands of the others that are out there, you can start spreading a little farther away from that core flavor profile. And that's really what a lot of us are trying to do. Jerry, please go. Would you like to stand up here? No. No. <laughs> if, if I go up there, I'm not supposed to give my opinion about uh, stuff. I'm just supposed to talk. Ask questions. <laughs> um, yeah, He's fine. on my team, yeah. and that was great. <laughs> um, I think to talk about variations year to year, 
from soil or rainfall and how that affects a specific strain is, a, of course, that happens with every crop. To call that terroir without some controlled data, to me, seems a little, I'm open to the possibility of it, sure. but to, to, to do the same thing, you bring up Maris Otter and Golden Promise, like, yeah, they're not just grown in two different places, they have different genetic heritage. So that's not an example of terroir. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the sense of place idea is fantastic. And I think it can even go beyond, we don't have any, I don't, I don't even think Ryan's got any upstairs, but Brimstone's another example of that, of like, what, what personality and flavor does your area of the world use and celebrate, what exemplifies it, and use that. Whether the ingredient is actually from there or not, make something that kind of represents the personality and character of a place. Um, and I'd love to see, I mean, I'd love to, well, I'm, I'm not even a big wine guy. Plenty of you guys know a lot more about wine than me. But even the wine world has been debating this for the last two decades. Does terroir even exist in wine, or is it all bullshit? So um, I, I'd love for us to throw our, our, our name in the hat for that conversation. But I, I think it's far from over, but it's fun to explore for sure. Um, I, I'd like to just broaden the, uh, the concept of terroir, because it, it, for me, it's not just about the grain. It, it's about as you said, about where it's grown, the territory, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the climate conditions. But throughout the whiskey process, starting with taking the water out of the ground, it's going to be different from one place to the next. Right, right, right. And the, so there's, you know, as you said before, the weather conditions in New York are considerably different than down at Balcones mm -hmm. or in Washington, D.C. And so it isn't, the terroir is not just about the grain. It's about the entire process and location and uh, how it's made yeah. that establishes it's, it's it. It's culture and agriculture. Terroir is not just one, it's both. Really. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, back first. I'm hold you back. I, up in the back first. Hurry, hurry up, get that man a mic. This is something that he's killing himself right now. Yeah. Let's get that in front of him. Yes. So, um, okay, so here's, here's, here's my counter to all that. Um, um, so this thing I'm sitting in here is, is called a what? A chair. And this thing right here I've got in front of me is called a what? It's called a table. Now there's a lot of similarities between the two of them, but if we start calling one thing another thing, then we confuse an enormous amount of things. What does terroir mean, literally from the French, of the earth? Of the earth, right? Now when we get to wine, and I can appreciate the wine conversation on this as well, um, We've got four or five um, steps between a grape that grows on a vine and the thing that's in my glass. And the only transformation that was actually done in there, which is a natural fermentation. I don't really need anyone at all to make wine. I can take some grapes and put them in my pocket and let them naturally ferment, and essentially I've got wine. <laughs> I gotta be honest with you, you gotta dry clean those pants. I, I'm, yeah, I'm not gonna tell you right which now. pocket either. <laughs> But uh, you guys are all uh, involved in actually a manufacturing facility. And essentially what you're doing is you're making chemical changes to something natural. You are putting um, essentially a, uh, an alcoholic mash into a bullet and um, uh, under pressure and then applying heat to it and you're making chemical changes in it. As a matter of fact, when you look at the entire distillation process, there's chemical change being made all the time. And so for me, that actually then um, eliminates the word or the, uh, the concept of terroir. However, what that does mean, I, I was just having this conversation earlier today, um, we put the same distillate in two different barrels and then we tasted it and they were completely different. So how can that be terroir? The word that I think that I'm an advocate of actually using, which I think describes all of this, is provenance. And provenance is from the origin. Now that takes, that takes into, into effect everything. The water, the soil, the, the grain, um, the fermentation time, uh, the type of still, um, uh, all of the wood management process over that. And most importantly, because you are manufacturers, it takes into account the savoir-faire of the distiller. 
Because if you take the distiller out of there, you really got nothing, right? I can make wine in my pocket, as we've already described. <laughs> you can't make whiskey without any of you. And that is not terroir. So with all of that together, I just think provenance becomes the, the, the actual word we should be using to describe this particular or any distilled product. Because then it separates it from that. And it's not really about, about from the earth anymore. It has all of these other different uh, the, the, uh, you know, uh, things that are added on top of it. Maybe we should stick to English. Should, uh, let me, I, no, 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 Robin, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to use French, I don't like it. Yes, Louis, Louis, you're joking, but it's true, it's, it's, we talk a lot about craft, and that's in here as well, I mean, the word terroir is difficult for Americans, and nobody really gets it, we totally agree, provenance, it's, to us, it's about does the grain matter? Does the grain influence flavor? We believe we've proven that to be the case. And, and it has an if we don't use the word terroir, fine. It's hard to say so, for most yeah. people anyway. Great. Robin, if I were to say, I'm going to say a statement, and I want you to tell me if in your mind this is true, because I think it's a fair thing worth asking. Grain, cereal grain, malted barley, or barley has terroir. Whiskey has provenance. Is that true to you? So say, I'm sorry, just so does, that. So yeah, barley has yeah. terroir. Whiskey has provenance. That would make actually a lot yeah. of sense. Okay. Yeah, that would actually yeah. make and I would agree. Sense. So in the capacity yeah. of that, I yeah. firmly agree yeah. with you. Yeah. Our grain showcases unique terroir. We can taste it in our mash, yeah. which I appreciate yes. is a part of a process. Right. But let's be transparent. If you ground up some barley with your boots and added water, you are effectively mashing to a certain degree. Right. From here. But you haven't got, as soon as you start actually messing around with the, the, chemical, the chemical composition, then the, the, your, the terroir argument actually goes out the window. I don't necessarily have a, I don't have a disagreement with yeah. that. I okay. think yeah. the raw ingredients have terroir. Yeah. At Westland, we believe firmly in the concept of raw ingredient. Yeah. It's why we spend so much time thinking about raw ingredient selection. I agree. Our whiskey has a sense of place. It certainly has provenance. Absolutely, but, yeah. But the argument you know, that should be made is that why can't you make whiskey that takes the exact same every time? Why do you batch stuff? Why do you put stuff in, in to try to make a, a common thread? Because technically, there is difference. I mean, most of we can actually describe to wood, but in each time that you do that, unless you're doing it the exact temperature change to the exact cut points, to the exact everything, including put it out so you could only be the barrel that could be the only change. Because even the Rick House is a change. If I'm up in the <coughs> northwest corner and I have sunlight on it, if I have this, why are you taking all of that stuff and putting it in batches to even it out? Every single barrel should taste the same. I, I, I'd like to address that. <laughs> when we started out, uh, every batch was different. And uh, I, would go, I would go into a retailer or a, a restaurant or a bar, and uh, they would take the bottle off the shelf and hold it up next to the one I was trying to sell them and say, look, it's a different color. It, how can it be? So? I say, it's craft. It's handmade, but, no, but you know. But but let me just tell you yeah. that th that worked in the beginning. But the fact of the matter is that in order to sell a product, it needs to be consistent. No, but you're making and, it consistent. You're but, actually but taking for the barrels, the barrels, and the spot in the right. and the warehouse changes everything. I know, but that's that's sort of the point. That is the flavor differentiations that you're automatically getting from the same distillery. You're not. In other words, when you're temming off the still, no matter which one I take off the still, that new make should taste exactly the same every single time. It's the other factors that are happening afterwards. Yes. And, and, but I, I would argue that it doesn't necessarily always taste the same coming off the still every single Definitely. time. Yeah. Well, of course yeah. not, because Jared, the grain doesn't. Jericho, he's been but I'm saying but that's, but, that's the, but that's some of the stuff that you're tasting. We, we would have people all the time, and I'm sure you guys get it too, visitors come and say, I loved your product. This is, this is art. You're yeah. an artist. <laughs> and I would always say, the only person on our property that's an artist is the blender. Because he's the one the who takes blending. all the I'll raw materials it. Right. and makes sure that it's our product. That yeah. It stays the same yeah. every time. That's what you're going, I, I get that's what you're going for. And I'm not arguing either way. I'm just saying, but that's, that's the, just the logistics of what is happening. Um, and I think that's, I, I also think that's the beauty of it. I'm not, I'm not just degrading yeah. anything. Well, and I think Jared should have the floor for the next 15 <laughs> minutes because I, I, don't make sure. I, I don't, I don't want it for nearly that long. Uh, Gabe can correct me if I'm wrong, but to address the very first point that Robin was making, there, the amount of natural wine being made in the world is probably less than 1%. Yeah. It's being pitched. So nice idea, 
not really rel relevant to reality. Um, especially if you make a comparison between the wine industry and ours, that's not what they're doing, unfortunately. Um, second thing, you're, you're, the consistency argument off the stills is specifically talking about pot. Your column is going to make extremely consistent almost every time. Identical. Almost chemically identical, over 99.5% the same every time. Well, uh, that's, that's, uh, um, but yeah, the barrel is also an agri, the, the barrel is also, also an agricultural product. So of course there's variation. And if you guys, the consumers who pay our bills and keep our lights on, get super comfortable with batches not tasting the same, smelling the same, having different color every time, we will gladly give you that. But the biggest selling brands in the world are the whiskey equivalent of McDonald's and Applebee's, and people demand that every bottle they get, no matter what country, yep. state, year, mm -hmm. if that tastes different, damn it, they're not buying it again. Yep. Yep. So that's a, that's, a, that's a market problem that we get trapped by, and we do our best, and we have our, our parameters a little bit wider than some of those guys, but they can't be infinitely wide or you guys weren't going to buy it. Call it terroir, provenance, or whatever you want. But to use another French term, vive la différence. We'll have the entire session available to listen to soon at the WhiskeyCast website. That's WhiskeyCast In-Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best-kept secret. Hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskeys comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Let's begin with a couple of American single malts, starting with the new Westward Oregon Stout Cask Straight Malt Whiskey from House Spirits in Portland. It's made with an ale yeast and matured in ex-bourbon barrels before being finished in stout casks from one of Oregon's many craft breweries, and it's bottled at 45% ABV. The nose is malty and aromatic with notes of honey, vanilla, soft spices, a nice oakiness, and a touch of cedar shavings. The taste is malty at first, with smoothly building spicy notes of clove and allspice that are balanced by hints of cedar, oak, honey, and vanilla. The finish is long, with spices that fade away slowly and a nice creaminess left on the palate. I'm scoring the Westward Oregon Stout Cask Single Malt a 91. Colin Keegan at New Mexico's Santa Fe Spirits makes some unique American single malts with a southwestern flair, and his Col Keegan cask strength is no exception. It's bottled at 59% ABV and uses mesquite killed malted barley along with first fill ex bourbon barrels. The nose is complex with hints of sandalwood, mesquite, and charred oak, along with toasted caramel, allspice, and a hint of crystallized ginger that stands out nicely. The taste, woody and spicy, with black pepper and chili powder, balanced by charred oak, vanilla, sandalwood, and just a hint of caramel apples. The finish is long and spicy with a gentle woodiness and hints of dried fruits. I'm scoring the Colkegan Cask Strength Single Malt from Santa Fe Spirits, a 90. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. Rye whiskey was distilled by America's original risk takers and history makers. Those first barrels of whiskey were bold, flavorful, and full of passion. Sagamore Spirit proudly picked up the torch with their spring-fed Maryland-style rye whiskey, celebrating the grit and glory of those patriotic ancestors who sipped their way into American history. Visit sagamorespirit.com to explore their award-winning spirit. I mentioned this one earlier this week on social media. Lagavulin's new 11-year-old Offerman edition, named for the brand's number one fan and endorser, actor and comedian Nick Offerman. I posted photos of the press kit with the sample I received from Diageo. It's bottled at 46% ABV. The nose, rich and smoky with a gentle phenolic character and a hint of heather, soft spices, honey, dried flowers, and just a hint of brine. It reminds me of a warm Isla hug. 
The taste has a rich, creamy mouthfeel with a nice smokiness and a peppery character that's balanced by touches of dried flowers, honey, and vanilla with a slight hint of brine in the background. The finish, classic Lagavulin, long, smoky, and smooth. I'm scoring the Lagavulin Offerman Edition a 94. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'll be adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,700 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out today at whiskeycast.com. The search never ends, but it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's open up the inbox now for your voice, presented by Lot 40. Since I'm surrounded by a couple of hundred whiskey lovers here at the Julio's Liquors Whiskey Road Show, let's hear from some of them. The question, what will the new U.S. 25% tariff on imports of single malt Scotch whiskey and single malts from Northern Ireland do to their whiskey buying budgets? I absolutely think that people will be buying less scotch, so it's going to become more of that kind of the, the higher end things that people buy. You know, the higher price is going to drive less purchases of the scotch. Maybe we see less no age statement stuff coming out or more, depending on if they can dr- uh, drop the price. But I absolutely think whiskey and American craft whiskeys are probably going to boom pretty uh, shortly if they don't drop the tariffs. Are you going to wind up buying less whiskey because of the uh, tariffs on scotch and Northern Ireland whiskeys? That- took effect a couple weeks ago? No, because whiskey is a very wide category, so it doesn't necessarily, uh, it's not going to impact all of the all of the scotch or even all of the whiskey. It doesn't, it doesn't impact the blends as far as I understand. Uh, and if I like it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy it. But it's, it's, it's a luxury commodity, so I understand that it may impact some people's pocketbooks differently, but it's annoying, <laughs> but it wouldn't, it wouldn't make me buy less whiskey. I might buy possibly different whiskey, depending on what the prices go up to. Buy now, and then think very careful later, because the tariffs have no relation to the, what they're penalizing people for. So it's, it's silly, and are the governments in the UK, which have imposed tariffs on bourbon, getting any of that money back to the, to the scotch makers that are affected by this? Will it affect the way you buy your whiskey? Yes. But I, I'll, I'll buy now before January 1st because of the amount that's already here without tariffs. And then wait till after Christmas. And after January 1st, think carefully. How do you square the fact that these tariffs are supposed to punish Europe, but you're the one who's actually going to pay for it? Well, I don't. I think that's a bit... I mean, honestly, I don't really care. I think it's a bunch of bullshit because, I mean, we're getting punished. They're going to punish us in a few months. So it's 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 a reciprocal act based on a you know, political move. And this is, you know, I think in the makings long before the current Trump situation, this is something that's been in development for a long time. So it's I can't blame Trump for this one. You know, uh, I'd like to, but I can't. And it's just unfortunately the way it is. And I think we're going to see a few of our favorite specialty bottles come you know come in and so I think that's a shame but I think and I don't think it's gonna last forever I think the markets will adjust I'm a little bit nervous about it I've been stocking up and I'm hopeful that our suppliers will uh, make it a slow slowly painful process little little bits at a time don't hurt us all at once how are the tariffs gonna affect your whiskey buying probably not a lot I'll just gripe a lot more yeah, it, we'll see how it goes, but the price of whiskey's been going up gradually anyway over the last couple of years, so if it is what it is, and but good whiskey is good whiskey and worth paying for. Do you think the prices will come down when the tariffs end? I doubt it. Yeah, I sincerely doubt it, but because somebody's got to make some money somewhere off of it, and, uh, we'll see what happens. Thanks to everyone who took a few minutes to talk with me for this week's Your Voice. If you have something you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, look for us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at WhiskeyCast. You can also email us directly. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. Your Voice is presented by Lot 40, 
Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. It's time now for the moment whiskey clubs around the world have been waiting for. As the Whiskey Club of the Month moves over from our Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast to the big show. Each month we'll be honoring a whiskey club as our Club of the Month. And this time around, we're proud to name the Coastal Virginia Whiskey Society as our Whiskey Club of the Month. Heard from Chris Hutchison about the club, which started about 18 months ago and now has 25 members with monthly tastings and occasional visits from distillery and brand reps. Last week, they had a tasting of Kilhoman and Single Cask Nation whiskeys with the folks from Impex. Chris, thanks for using the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. We'll be sending your club two dozen Whiskey Cast Glencairn glasses to use at your club tastings. Now, if you have a whiskey club, do like Chris did and use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to let us know about your club. If you have a website address or a social media presence, we'll be glad to add your club to our list of whiskey clubs around the world at the WhiskeyCast website. Who knows? Your club could be our Whiskey Club of the Month in December. The Whiskey Club of the Month is supported by Glencairn Crystal. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and other stuff that all combine to make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Raiders Tears. We've talked a lot in the past about the Lincoln County process, Tennessee's unique practice of filtering new make spirit through sugar maple charcoal that is said to mellow the spirit before it goes into a barrel. In fact, it's now a requirement under Tennessee state law for distilleries that want to call their whiskeys Tennessee whiskey to use the Lincoln County process, with one exception. Pritchard's Distillery, which never did use it, didn't want to, and fought to have themselves grandfathered in when state lawmakers approved the Tennessee Whiskey Law a few years ago. The thing is, there is no specific definition for exactly what makes up the Lincoln County process, and each distillery has its own unique method. For instance, Jack Daniels trickles its spirit through a vat of sugar maple charcoal slowly, in a process that can take two or three days. Gentleman Jack and the number 27 Gold Edition go through a second pass of charcoal filtering after maturation before they're bottled. Last week I was at the Cascade Hollow Distilling Company in Tullahoma, Tennessee, where the George Dickel Tennessee whiskeys are distilled. They use a completely different process. It also takes two or three days, but the spirit is chilled first and then filled into a vat full of charcoal. Master distiller Nicole Austin explained just what that does. As far as I know, we're the only one that applies chilling before the charcoal milling process, and we really lean into it. So we use full-size tanks, two to three day residence times on the charcoal. So if you had to put us on kind of a spectrum of Tennessee whiskeys, um, we really lean into the Lincoln County process. We use it quite heavily. And it was an area of the whiskey production that was very interesting to me because I thought of filtration as something that you wouldn't do if you had a really good whiskey, right? And why would you take things out, right? Um, and I also thought of filtration as if you filter something a lot, it should by necessity be very mellow or, or kind of approach neutrality, right? If you're using a very heavy filtration. But our whiskey is very much not like that. It's actually a pretty rich, pretty big, pretty bold whiskey. So I was very curious about this. I spent a lot of time when I started trying to understand that. And so, of course, the first place I started was just doing nosings of what was going in and what was coming out of the process. So right after distillation, we have our distillate is very heavy. It's very oily, um, a bit acetic. It's got like almost buttered popcorn, grain, those kinds of notes. And the oils are, are very noticeable, very present in the distillate. Even at high proofs, you can feel them coating your tongue. If you were to put that straight in a cask as it is, as a distillate, I think in maturation, it would potentially come across quite flawed. Um, And so it made sense to me that actually you'd want to do some changing of it. And what I came to understand, so the reason we have a distillate like that, everything about our process is designed to produce this rich, congener-heavy distillate 
We have a high corn mash bill, it's 84% corn, so you're getting really heavy grain notes anyway. So we have an open air fermentation, we don't use cooling. So everything about the beer is very flavorful going into the still. Then we have a low reflux still set up. So we have the beer feed right at the second tray of the, the beer still. So there's only one reflux still, it's basically a demister pad and a tray and that's it. And then we go right into the doubler. So our distillate, um, you know, you have sort of two choices, right? When the beer goes into the still, all of those congeners that are sitting in the beer, they're either ending up up the top in your whiskey or out of the bottom and they're getting fed to cows. So if you want to capture all of those rich congeners that you went so far out of your way to develop in the mashing and fermentation process by having those kind of longer fermentations in the open air, they're gonna bring along with it some undesirable characteristics. And because of the sort of simplicity of this typical American distillation, you don't have a choice. If you're getting one, you're getting the other. So to get that rich waxy fruit character that's the signature of Dickel, it comes along with this heavy oil in the distillation process. So the chill charcoal mellowing is utilized to balance that out. So it selectively kind of goes after and removes only those heavier oily characters, those sort of um, buttered popcorn characters, those sulfury characters, so the, the charcoal itself is activated carbon. So it chemically forms a bond preferentially with those types of molecules. So it's, there's a chemical process where it's pulling those out of the, the distillate. Then because of the chilling, you also have a physical separation happening. So those oils are flocculating, they're kind of congealing with each other, and then they're passing through what is essentially a charcoal filter, so they're being physically removed. So you have both a chemical and a physical separation happening when chill charcoal mellowing is, is going on. That high residence time really gives time for all of that to come out. So you can imagine these two characteristics, waxy, fruity, and heavy, oily. That's, it had the distillate had both of those when it went into the chill charcoal mellowing process. When it comes out, you have a nice smooth mouthfeel, but it's not heavy and oily anymore. And you've retained that waxy fruit character. So it takes out just the things you don't want and leaves behind that rich, heavy character that gives Dickel its house style. Other distillers do the bare minimum, passing their spirit through a charcoal-filled filter after it comes off the still. And there are almost as many ways to implement the Lincoln County process as there are distilleries in Tennessee. Where did the idea come from? Well, the best historical documents show that Jack Daniel learned about it from Nathan Nearest Green, who taught Jack how to make whiskey when Nearest was a slave on the farm of the Reverend Dan Cole, who took Jack Daniel in before the Civil War. But there's no indication whether Mr. Green learned the process somewhere else or came up with it on his own. And as for the Lincoln County name, well, that's where Jack Daniel's distillery was originally located in Lynchburg, Tennessee. The county lines were later redrawn, and the distillery wound up in Moore County, where it's still located today. Full disclosure, I was at the Cascade Hollow Distillery as a guest of Diageo, along with a group of other reporters. But as with all of the content you'll hear here on WhiskeyCast, full editorial control remains with WhiskeyCast. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, a unique triple distilled premium Irish whiskey, combining single malt and single pot still. First fashioned in the 1700s and still a rarity today. Sure, as we say in Ireland, what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast from the Julio's Liquors Whiskey Road Show in Westboro, Massachusetts. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our Whiskey Cast HD videos and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast. You'll also find the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, the whiskey photo of the week, the calendar of events. And, of course, a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We'll be starting our 15th year of Whiskey Cast soon, and we have a few ideas already in mind to celebrate the anniversary of Whiskey's longest-running podcast series. But we're always looking for a few more. If you have an idea, let us know about it. 
You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Get in touch with us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or you can always email us. The address is comments at whiskeycast.com. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch Whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2019 and usually comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. But this time around, I'm at the Julio's Liquors Whiskey Road Show in Westboro, Massachusetts. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening.